Hello and welcome in to another episode of the Fantasy Football Forecast. I'm your host, Trevor Scott, joined by my co-host, Matt Duraldi. What's going on, guys? And we are here to get into our top 20 running backs. We're going to break this down into a part one and a part two video, just as we have with quarterbacks and wide receivers. And so we'll go through the first three tiers of running backs uh, in this video, and then we'll go through tier four and tier five in the next one. So this will cover the top nine running backs today. So getting into number one here, this shouldn't come as a surprise to anybody, but that will be Christian McCaffrey. Christian McCaffrey finished his RB1 last year by over 100 half PPR points. Don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this. He's obviously the clear front one or the clear number one pick. Now, if you're in a 12 team, three wide receiver format, you know, I could see going with someone like a CD Lamb just because wide receiver thins out so much. But in a standard league, it's the clear choice. Anyone who's saying, don't draft CMC or fading him or whatever. They're just looking for attention. So does that make me an attention seeker then? Cause I have well, a three overall. I'm I, like, we play in a 10 team, three wide receiver league. Right. And I have lamb and Tyreek Hill, both above McCaffrey. No, um, I said, and obviously wide receiver, that's fine. Yeah. In 12 team, three wide receiver. Yeah. No, in standard leagues though, you're right. In, in two wide receiver leagues, he's for sure the first pick. Like there's not really a debate there. Um, but I will say that, you know, obviously he had head and shoulders above everybody else in terms of production last year. He was head and shoulders in production better two years ago. But, you know, we still do have the injury concerns here, um, you know, and he's showed health two straight years. So I get it's not quite as bad as it was a couple years back, but I still just with running backs in general have have a little bit of hesitation on their higher risk of injury. So that's that's kind of why I think I just prefer the receivers in a three wide receiver format in our format. Um, you know, but obviously he's going to be great uh, when he's on the field. There's no competition here. And this is really, a you know, we, we're going to have other players in this tier, but this is really a tier of, of its own here. And uh, I, I don't blame you for going first overall. Even in Superflex, I could see him going first overall, just just because he provides such a positional advantage. All right. So number two, we got Brees Hall. We did do a breakdown video of Brees Hall and our next running back here in uh, tier one, but we did kind of settle on Brees being the top option. And the offense overall should be much better for the Jets, right? They, they're going to have Rodgers back. They brought in Mike Williams to open up the field down the field. Uh, they drafted a receiver, Corley. So I think the offense is going to open up and Brees should be much better on the ground this year. Um, you know, from week like four to 14, he was terrible on the ground, like, you know, 50, 60 yards every game, but obviously broke out towards the end of the year, got heavily involved in the receiving game, putting up 20 plus point games all over the place. So I think um, you know, with the elevated level of rushing, that should help absorb any downturn he has in upside in terms of the receiving game, right? I don't think he's going to have very many 16 target games like he did once last year um, or, you know, even eight, nine catch games. I just don't know that that's really what their offense wants to do. Um, but I think the rushing should be a lot better. The offense overall should provide many more scoring opportunities. And he's another year removed from that knee injury. So I think he's going to be ready to go. And, you know, it's obviously a very explosive player. So the big plays um, should come in abundance here. Yeah, no, I agree. And the improved O-line, you know, can't be understated either. Yeah, for sure. That's actually a very good point, right? Another, another factor that'll help open up lanes for him on the ground. All right, then I alluded to it at the, the top of the Brees Hall conversation, but the number three, and we did a breakdown video between these two specifically, is Bijan Robinson. Yeah, so Raheem Morris quoted, get the ball to Bijan as much as you can in as many situations as you possibly can, which I think, you know, is kind of wheels up for him. They're going to be using him in that CMC type role. Last year, Tyler Algier had almost 200 touches whereas Bijan had under 30% of red zone carries and under 20% of carries within the five-yard line. I think Arthur Smith was just trying to make winning games as difficult as possible last year. And I think <laughs> with the new coach coming in, like he's going to use all his shiny new toys, and the offense overall should be much more efficient with the addition of Kirk Cousins. So, you know, I'm, I'm kind of tempted to move him up to two, but I think, you know, he's one of the few guys that can – you know, potentially finishes the number one RB this year. 
Yeah, I agree for sure. And I think, like you said, potentially moving him up to two. Um, I th I think whichever of these two guys goes later in your draft is just the one that I would want to target, right? Like, I don't want to have to make this decision. I'd rather just wait around. And if, um, you know, or if you're at six or seven overall in a standard league or beginning of the second round in a super flex league, right? Like one of these guys uh, could be available there kind of at the turn around the 12, 13 range, you know, and that's maybe where I'd consider getting in on one of these guys if they're still there. And, you know, you're at the tier of receivers starting like around Puka Nakua, right? I think that's kind of the the overall look at where these guys should be going in the draft. So um, really like Bijan this year. I think he's going to be the major focal point of the offense. Uh, that's the end of tier one. So we'll get into tier two here, starting with number four overall, Saquon Barkley. Um, we talked about this tier as well with, with uh, four, five, and six uh, in a separate video as well. And since that video, um, we kind of discussed where we should put these guys. And I, I moved, decided to move Saquon up uh, one spot. Um, I think he's in a unique position behind an O-line that he's never had in his career. And I just think he still has all the explosion in the world. They went out and paid him, so they're going to use him heavily. And I think um, with Kellen Moore, right, that the, they're going to use his passing game abilities in a, in a big way. We've seen him be a very, very high-end running back multiple years. Uh, we've seen him go over 2,000 yards, total yards. I know that was his rookie season. It's been a while since then. But this is going to be the best offense that he's been a part of. And when you have A.J. Brown and Devontae Smith opening up the field for you, you know, the linebackers aren't just going to be able to crash down on the line of scrimmage. And Saquon should be able to have wide open holes through the line. We saw it so many times with DeAndre Swift last year, just running untouched through the line. And, you know, I think with Saquon back there, that that just adds a high level of opportunity for him to, to be a very good player. Yeah, I mean... Injury aside, if he finishes outside of top five, I would be very surprised. Now, you know, Hertz does run the ball and, you know, the tush push in the end zone might cap his touchdown ceiling. But like you said, with the other guys taking away defenders, I think, you know, it's going to open up a lot of lanes for him. Yeah. And, you know, there was there was a lot of weeks where Swift, I was frustrated as a Swift owner last year because I just felt like he should have been better. But, you know, I don't think that that's going to be the case with Saquon this year. I think he's going to be excellent and you know maybe they do decide to give him some of those one yard touchdowns maybe he gets in he doesn't get tackled on the one yard line so much because i know that happened to swift four or five times last year so um we'll, we'll see how that part of it plays out but not i think like overall he's about it yeah not at all not at all it's not like i played him over Devonte adams in the finals and lost because of it so you know <laughs> uh but yeah anyway so that's that's a wrap on saquon getting into the fifth Player, this is the guy I've decided to move Saquon ahead of, Jameer Gibbs. I think that Jameer Gibbs has, like, crazy upside here. I think uh, David Montgomery is the reason he's not higher. I think if David Montgomery wasn't there, he'd be, you know, in that tier with Brees Hall and Bijan, like, maybe even pushing ahead of them. And I think, you know, the, just the explosion, being able to score from anywhere, being an excellent receiver going into his second year where he's not going to have this role concern at the beginning of the year where... He was kind of getting eased into the action and David Montgomery was having these massive games. I don't, I don't expect that dynamic to be uh, their roles at the start of the year. So I would expect to see, uh, you know, Gibbs getting in that 12, 15 touch range right out of the gate, you know, not down in the seven to, to nine touch range and has the upside obviously to get 20 carries in any games or 20 touches, I'm sorry, in any game. So depending on game script and how, uh, how hot his hand is during the game. I'm starting to push him up quite a bit as well. If you remember when we did the breakdown with Saquon, Gibbs, and JT, my biggest concern were those, you know, first half where Gibbs had three touches for 30 plus yards. But I think, like you said, with last year easing him onto the field, I think this year he's going to pick up really where he left off. And I think sometimes people might even just kind of underrate him as an actual running back. I think we see a smaller body guy that catches passes, but between the tackles and, you know, his vision and patience, I think is, is truly elite. So yeah, I, I, I want to move him up to four ish, but he's someone I'm, I'm getting more and more excited about as the off season goes on. Yeah. And when, well, you know, when we, when we first started looking at this, right, I wasn't all that thrilled about taking him 
in the second round, you know, I was kind of like, ah, oh, I don't know. Like, I feel like I kind of would rather have a second receiver than going in on Gibbs. Um, but I've seen him in super flex leagues going, you know, 18, 19, 20. So if you start with a, an elite receiver, right, you start with a CD lamb or a Tyree kill and you come back around and you're able to lock in Jameer Gibbs is kind of your anchor running back, get a receiver, a quarterback in the third round. Um, as it comes back around, you know, you don't really need to go back to the well at running back for a while, you know, if you didn't want to, if you want to try and fill out the rest of your team, um, load up on receiver, he's a very good running back that you can get in the second round that you can have an anchor running back build around. Yeah. And he's one of the the last few that I'm very comfortable with going hero RB. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think hero RB, we can get into that strategy maybe towards the end of the video. Cause I think I'm comfortable with kind of any of these, uh, tier one, two or three picks as, as a hero RB. But yeah, so getting into Jonathan Taylor here, right? This is somebody that I've I've kept at six. This has been my my same ranking here. I think he is going to be in a great offense in a way that he hasn't before. So I think pushing him back up the board, because I know last year he was hurt coming in. The year before he had the high ankle sprain that kind of wrecked his year. So I think ideally he's going to be coming into the year healthy this year for the first time you know, well, I mean, he was the first pick, first overall pick a couple of years ago, but then he was hurt, right? Hurt last year, coming into this year healthy. And I think we're, we're seeing him really rise back up draft boards here. He still has all the explosiveness. He's going to be running alongside Anthony Richardson. So I think that's going to help open up running lanes for him. I expect to see some, you know, read option running plays that hopefully will get him on the perimeter, um, you know, and he's, he's very dangerous out there. Very, very good at breaking tackles and is a speedster with, with the best of them. So I think Overall, he also doesn't really have any competition in the backfield, right? Anthony Richardson is going to be kind of taking touchdowns similar to Saquon. But I think in terms of backfield running mate, there isn't really going to be uh, competition back there with him. So I think he's basically the only game in town. Zach Moss has moved on. And I think he's going to be excellent this year. Um, again, another guy in Superflex, 10-team Superflex leagues that goes towards that turn pick. Uh, around 20, you know, sometimes he even makes it through the turn. You can get him in the third round, beginning of the third round. So if you do start quarterback and then grab receiver, say like, you know, somebody you like, like Garrett Wilson falls to pick 18 and then you're at 23 and he's still there. I think that's an excellent way to start your team. Excellent build yeah. to get kind of elite players at each one of the three positions, um, you know, as, a, as an overall strategy. Yeah, I, I agree with all that. And just kind of on a side tangent, could you imagine if Kansas City Chiefs drafted him instead of Clyde Edwards? Dude, I that is still it was a slam them. dunk too. It's not like he wasn't the best running back in college either. Yeah. Like <laughs> he was the best talent too. He was the highest rated in terms of talent after the combine. That that was, I think that was kind of, not to not to throw shade, but I think that was kind of a Patrick Mahomes pick. I think Mahomes kind of went at Clyde because of how good of a pass catcher Clyde was in college. And he was part of that 2019 LSU team that we talk about all the time. Um, but yeah, obviously that didn't work out for the chiefs. It's really too bad. They didn't take him. All right. So tier three, right? Low end RB ones, right? So in a 10 team league, it's kind of what we're looking at. These are the guys that kind of go towards the, the end, but we still feel very confident that they are going to finish as RB ones. And the first guy of this tier is Travis Etienne. Yeah, so kind of reflecting back at how I've drafted the last couple of years, you know, I'm always super, super high on rookies. And I took ETN his rookie year. It didn't really work out. I totally faded him last year because I was all over Tank Bigsby. And what a mistake that was. I mean, he finished running back three. He was the focal point of the offense. He catches passes. He does all the right things. And I think, you know, this year he's set up again for a very heavy workload. Now they've said they want to lighten the load, but Tank Bigsby was, he was just awful last year. So unless it's just a breather or something like that, I don't really see him taking a big um, step forward. Now the 12 touchdowns that he scored, I would expect a little bit of a negative regression in that regard. But at RB7, I think that's someone I'm going to be in on, assuming I miss on the top six guys. Yeah, and he's he's an interesting one to talk about. I think he's the most interesting of this group that we've discussed. Because like you said, the touchdown upside, I think, overall is going to be less. Or, you know, I mean, I guess the upside could be 12. But I think how many we expect him to score is, like, for sure going to be less. So that's – and he had a bunch of two touchdown games. But I also don't think the Jaguars' offense is going to be as good as it was last year. And, 
it's no secret that I don't have a lot of confidence in Trevor Lawrence. So there's there's a lot of things kind of playing against him. But at the end of the day, last year, he was RB3 overall, right? He finished in that elite tier of running backs. He was very productive. He he had many games where he was just a league winner in terms of owning him. So I, I'm very excited to draft Travis Etienne, honestly. Like it's it's not very rare or it's it's pretty rare for me to have a guy at the beginning of a tier that I really want and I would really be happy getting. Uh, but you know, you see him go towards the end of the third round. So if you go receiver, receiver at the turn, say you get like an AJ Brown Garrett Wilson uh at that part of the turn, right? And you're at pick 27, 28 overall. And he's Travis Etienne is still there. I think if you want to get a running back that has as much upside as anybody we've talked about so far, he's he's your guy. And this is the guy in the tier that I do think has the highest upside, which, you know, generally I like to wait until the end of a tier, but I wouldn't have any problem getting in as the uh, on the first player of this tier here. Yeah, I agree. And anyone who's listening that just skipped to the ETN section when Trevor says 27, we're looking at this through the frame of a, you know, a super flex format too so i've gotten a couple comments where like no you're crazy but just just keep that in mind <laughs> yeah and we're also talking three wide receiver super flex league right so there will be quarterbacks in there the receivers all get pushed up in that format um so yeah that's that's what i'm talking about maybe we should start doing some more mock drafts here um in the near future and give give people an idea of where what we're seeing and why we're saying the numbers we are um because obviously in a standard he's gonna be a second round pick probably a pretty early second round pick. If you're in two wide receivers, um, yeah. you know, he'll probably be going, you know, 13, 14 overall, 15 overall, probably. And um, if you're so, in a 10 you know, team, two wide receiver format, change it to three wide receiver because that's just ridiculous. Yeah. Change it to three wide receiver or add a flex uh, for sure. At the very least. Right. I like having the third wide receiver because it forces you to play more receivers and it really makes the value of the top end receivers match that of the top end running backs. Um, because you have to go down to 30 at receiver and you only have to go down to 20 at running back, right? It's just, uh, that seems obvious, but it makes the top end players so much more valuable because of the replacement level that you need at your starting positions. Um, all right. So that was a yeah. little bit of a tangent there. Maybe we clipped that for a short, uh, but getting into <laughs> number eight is Kyron Williams. So, um, I'll tee up Kyron Williams cause I am higher on Kyron than, than you are, Matt. And I think that Assuming that Blake Corum doesn't really cut into his touches or his volume in a major way, you know, obviously he's going to a little bit because Kyron was like a 90% shot snap share player, which we don't see in the NFL at all, right? I mean, he played the most, the highest percentage of snaps of anybody. So, you know, if that goes down to 70 or, or 65, I still think he's going to be getting most of the carries and quite a bit of the, any receptions that are available. And with that production last year, he was... Elite. I mean, he he obviously finished, uh, or he obviously got hurt, right? And he had four weeks he was out. But on a per game basis, he was RB two last year, only behind McCaffrey. And you know, he had mil multiple games over 150 yards. He had multiple scores in certain games. He had a six catch, 60 yard, two two receiving touchdown game. So that's there if they want to use it in terms of his skill set. So it's really hard for me to to not be in on Kyron. I I do think he generally goes higher than this um, in most people's rankings. You know, you'll see him up at five or six in that tier above. Um, so I am lower on him than consensus, which I think will mean that I'm not going to get as much of him, but I am a little worried about the size and the injury, right? We saw him get hurt last year and they went and spent a third round pick on another running back. Um, now, obviously he needed a running mate. I mean, that when he was down, it was like, who is even going to start? Who's even going to play? Like they went and signed guys, Royce Freeman off the, off the street to kind of come in and get carries, you know? So that, that spot was a huge need for them, but I don't know that that's necessarily going to cut a lot into his workload. Yeah. I just, I kind of have this fear that he played above his ability last year and we're going to see a big regression and we're going to see Blake Corum step in and take more of the workload than people are projecting. And I know we kind of talked about this with Zach Charbonnet and with Tank Bigsby, but the difference between Kyron Williams and Kenneth Walker and Travis Etienne were Walker and Etienne were, you know, high profile, high draft picks, very big time college performers that check these boxes as, more workhorse backs in the NFL. Kyron's undersized, doesn't jump out at you for any given reason, but I don't know. He's just someone who's kind of on my do not draft 
list this year and you know maybe i'll eat my words but um yeah i'm just worried about quorum honestly yeah which that makes sense right if quorum does come in and becomes the more productive player or takes the starting role i mean obviously that's not going to be ideal but i just don't see that happening based on last year's results uh, so like would you push him down an entire tier because of that would you push him down below say like you know josh jacobs or isaiah pacheco i would probably feel more comfortable with pacheco i would feel much more comfortable with henry jacobs probably about the same uh, that's interesting so let's get into one of those guys that you just mentioned derrick henry yeah so someone who has no competition for touches or getting beaten out for the role who's going on to the best team of his career that wants to run the ball he's going to be running behind one of the best offensive lines of his career i know the o-line took a step back this off season with the subtraction of a couple guys, but it's Baltimore. They figure it out. I think that his upside is almost 20 touchdowns and they're going to feed him like crazy. And I think he's going to be one of those guys where we look back in week five and, you know, he's top three and we're going to be like, why were we all fading him? I know that you like him too. So I'd be curious to hear your thoughts. Maybe you're not quite as high, but, you know, with Gus Bus and J.K. Dobbins gone, Keaton Mitchell hurt, and this offense being very efficient, I just see a a guy that I'm going to be going after quite a bit. Yeah, no, I mean, I I don't know that we're fading him. You know, we would have him at nine, and you know, I still think he's extremely productive. Right, the upside is clear on the ground in terms of touchdowns. Like, I don't think he's going to get to twenty, but I don't think anybody would be surprised by fifteen. I just think he has zero upside at all like for any production in the receiving game so in leagues that don't give you bonuses for going over 100 rushing yards for example right and it, you know even if you have a 120 yard game if he doesn't score in that game that's like what 12 points and it, you know this feels like it should be so much better of a game but it's not you know and like Maybe Lamar steals more of the touchdowns. Lamar doesn't really work inside the five yard line, but maybe they have multiple games in a row where, you know, they don't really have many carries inside the five and he doesn't score. And that'll be a little bit frustrating, um, I think. And, you know, the other, the other thing about his game too, you say there's no real competition, but last year he was getting out snapped pretty consistently by Tajay Spears because he wasn't on the field for passing downs. So if they have anybody that they plan on using in that role and they get like, they don't really get down, but you know, they get in situations in the two and the four minute drill where they're going to be passing and he's not on the field, you know, that could be possibly areas that leave more to be desired for him. So not to say that I'm not excited, right? I'm very excited about him. He's playing on the best, best situation he's played in a long time. He had one of the worst offensive lines in the, in the league last year, and he's going to one of the best. So he should on the ground be, be able to dominate. Yeah, and I think to your point with Tajay Spears, I think that's very game script dependent too. I mean, Baltimore is yeah. not going to be trailing in the amount of games that Tennessee was. Yeah, and that's fair. And that's not to th none of that was to say I don't like Henry. Like he's yeah. he's somebody I am I'm extremely he's like a very heavy target actually in terms yeah. of draft strategy because if you can go receiver 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 then again just to just to reiterate it's three wide receiver super flex right he's not going in the fourth round of regular drafts right but in super flex three wide receiver we see him go into the fourth round quite a bit right so if you are able to go receiver 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 say you have the seventh pick in your draft right and you you end up with aj brown garrett wilson and then in that, in that third round say somebody falls to you like Brandon Ayuk, right? And you're sitting there with three wide receivers and Derrick Henry's still on the board in the fourth round. Instead of maybe picking quarterback 15 or the 14, you know, and, and you feel comfortable with the guys around 20, you get in on your anchor running back there and then you handle your quarterbacks in round five and six. I, I really like him. I just, I just don't want to, I don't want it to be like he's got, you know, slam dunk top five upside because I think there is a situation where you know, he doesn't end up realizing that if he doesn't get in the end zone as much as maybe we think, and, you know, it's 10 touchdowns instead of 15, um, you know, that's obviously still a very good and productive player, but it's not somebody with upside that's going to be in the top five. So, all right. And with cool. that, that is the end of our part one video. We've gone one through nine here, and we'll get into 10 through 20 in the next video in part two. Thank you guys so much for watching.